Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan McBride. My pronouns are he, him. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Staff Pride Network for LGBT plus colleagues and allies. Uh, we're very grateful to have you here today and our speakers and to everyone who put lots of effort into organizing this joint event with the uh, Race Equality Network at the university here. Uh, David crichton uh, is also here as a co-chair and I'll let him say, I'll pass to him to uh, say a little uh, hello and uh, about the Race Equality Network as well. Absolutely, hello. I'm David, I'm the current co-convener for professional services for the Race Equality Network. And our main sort of role is bringing together people of colour, allies, to basically look at the different bits and pieces that are going on within the university to try and figure out what to make of them, where we want to go with this, the what particular fights we should be trying to pick and whether or not they're necessarily a good idea. And also to try and sort of bring a sense of network and community around what is one of the smaller but getting better represented communities within the university. So we are really happy to be here and be a part of this event. So thank you very much. Thanks, David. I am there. Uh, I'll, uh, Zara is our uh, Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic, BIM rep on the Staff Pride Network Committee. Uh, if you would like to also volunteer uh, to uh, make a difference at the university for uh, LGBT plus people, uh, uh, staff, students, um, we would love to uh to hear from you so there are several positions available at the moment uh just with the people leaving the university it's a natural thing with the committee so we'd love to hear from you uh the this month is lgbt plus history month uh with uh blurring borders um uh theme and i'll pass over to zara now to uh tell you a little bit more about uh today's event and introduce uh Andres, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so as Jonathan said, I'm Zara and I am the BAME rep for the Staff Pride Network. Um, we're really excited to be co-hosting this event today with Erin um, to uh, hear some of Andres' uh, poetry and um, have some discussion about uh, kind of some of the themes that are explored in it. So, um, Andres, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Andres N. Ordrica. I am a queer Latinx uh, poet, writer, and educator. Uh, I also happen to work at the university uh, uh, in uh, information services. And yeah, um, I guess we'll say a bit about my collection. I know we're going to talk about it in the questions later, but uh, my debut collection at least this I know, is published with the great uh, Indie Press for for Inc, who are a Scottish based uh, publisher. And it is a collection that explores different facets of the self and identity. And uh, I'm starting to talk about it as a poetic memoir because it's been pointed out to me that it is that. I don't think I was brilliant enough to go uh, out of my way to write a poetic memoir but it somehow reads that way, which is very interesting as a writer when you um, are told you've done something and you can't really take the credit for it. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to, am I starting out with some poems or are we starting out with questions? I think I'm jumping the gun. <laughs> um, I think we were thinking to start with some questions and then uh, hear some poems. Perfect. Although you were leading beautifully into the first question. So the first question, I guess, is, oh, there we go. Can you tell us a little bit about the collection and the journey of how you got to this piece of work? So the fact that it's become this sort of biographical piece is quite interesting. So how did it sort of come about? Did you start with a load of random bits and pieces and slowly bring them together into that form? Or did you have a sort of destination in mind when you got started on it? Yeah, I definitely think it was a bit of both. When I, I write between prose and poetry, 
Um, but when it comes to poetry, I think I'm often in each poem. I say a lot of my poems are written from the I voice. I, you know, I am the speaker or, you know, and I think it would be really hard to sort of differentiate and say I'm not present in each of these poems and they're definitely written from life. So I think by nature, they were already there to kind of build this bigger narrative. Um, but when I started to sort of collate what I wanted to be in a first collection, it became very obvious that the narrative was starting with childhood and going into adulthood. And by virtue of being um, queer and a person of color and now an immigrant myself living within the UK, there were all of these different intersections then that were presented in each of the poems. And because a lot of these identities I've always carried, um, it was very interesting then to see how that changed. So when, you know, these po poems that are very obviously centered in the memory of childhood and how they may be reflecting on my sort of own family history and, you know, my four grandparents uh, immigrated during the early 1960s from Mexico into the US and so kind of that kind of understanding as like a child of of sort of being American but a part of you being other like this there's this other place that you are told you come from or your family comes from and that you belong and then what is it to be you know in your uh, uh, sort of mid 20s to early 30s living in the UK and marrying, uh, you know, uh, someone from Scotland and, and being in their home somewhere that they've lived almost all of their lives. And what is that like? Because I grew up in a very sort of third culture kid kind of way. We followed my father's job in the US Air Force all around the globe, you know, so as an American, I've spent most of my life actually outside of the US. So all of these sort of notions of identity and belonging um are so present in so much of my poetry that like i said yeah it was pretty obvious as i started sort of sifting through them that there was this inherent narrative there that's really interesting and um actually really ties into the the question which it which um i suppose you touched on a little bit but i'd really love to hear more about kind of the process of like tying identity to these poems and like how you went about kind of putting that on paper where it's such a kind of diverse experience yeah it was i think i i wanted to have a very intersectional approach i think because for me um it felt more interesting to sort of play with these notions of like, what is it to be queer and have a racialized body? What is it to sort of grow up within a certain diaspora whose, um, whose sort of culture is so influenced by uh, colonialism and, and very specifically within Latin America, like Catholicism and growing up within the Catholic Church and someone who still maintains some relationship with his faith upbringing, but then being queer. So I think it would, it's so impossible for me when I'm actively choosing to write the self in poems to not sort of be thinking about all of these things at any given time. Um, but I do think as I was putting it together, you know, there is like one section in particular that is all about queerness. And I think queerness is so very present in so many of the poems, but there were very specific aspects of like my queer identity that I wanted to live with in those poems in itself. And a lot of those poems, I think, are very like desirous and um, some reviewers have described them as like sexy, but sad, <laughs> which is like kind of like my vibe, I guess. Um, but for me, it was very important that, that, that because I chose to break up the collection, I think in five different sections, I wanted something that was totally queer because for me, I think I was one of those people who came into hit, like realizing that I was not straight very late in life or later than a lot of my peers upon reflection. Um, and so for me, I wanted the space for those poems to live on their own. But then I think, you know, especially 
other people from the LGBT community, I think will re read, you know, the collection from cover to cover and very much see the young sort of queer boy that someone sort of sitting at that liminal space of the closet and it will be very obvious. But yeah, so I think it is challenging to sort of decide you're going to write about all these identities that you um, feel are a part of yourself. Um, but yeah, yeah, and then having to sort of, I don't know necessarily come to the decision, but actively sort of saying, you know what, it's been a very, it's been a journey for me. I want to give space to queerness on its own. So though it lives within other poems, I actively want this section to be, you know, very queer and very loud and very colorful, but also like I think some, you know, of the advanced readers kind of caught on to. Also, there is sort of a sadness. There's trying to work through it and, and this understanding of what that means. And then someone who's always been sort of obsessed with wanting to belong because of this transient upbringing. I think there's also in that section of the collection, this idea of trying to root then within sort of found family and the queer community. And what is that like as you're, if you come out sort of a bit later in life? Right, well, that was, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot to take in. We've had a couple of questions. I think now would be as good a time as any to hear some of the poems themselves. So, Andres, if you're ready, and we'll sort of have a few of the poems and then do a question and then a few more again and then another question and then we'll open up to the wider Q&A. So before you get started, I'll just say if you do have any questions that you want us to ask Andres as part of the session, then please feel free to drop them in the Q&A. We'll go through them and we'll try and get through as many as we can at the end. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to read four poems in this section. Um, and yeah, I think um, they all kind of explore definitely different aspects of, of the self. Um, the first half of the collection really works through these ideas of family and kind of mapping out my own family history uh and and what that how that has influenced me as as a writer so this first poem is uh one written about uh my family and very specifically uh, a memory of when i was quite young um and we were living uh, down south. My father was stationed uh, at RAF Mildenhall. And I believe that the photo that I'm referencing in the poem, I believe we were at uh, the campus uh, at Cambridge on a summer's day. So this is photograph. Summer light blinds my mother, 27 with golden ponytail, curls set by that pink tan of aquanet. In her cradled arms, me and my sister, aged six and four, the three of us sit still in an English garden. Rose bushes adorn us as a tree awakens its seasonal blossoms, the sun feeding us its warmth. Proper ladies sniff sprays of begonia while observing our every move around us, nature is neatly ordered. We are three strangers in that place. We wear shorts and windbreakers, Nike high top trainers. We always stood out in that way with father and brother directing from the other side of a lens. A photo can tell so much. Mother squinting, sister posing, Brother missing, father too, me burrowing deep within the earth. Um, so a lot of this collection was written during the first lockdown. Um, I am very fortunate to be a member of the Writers of Color group that is uh, put on by the Scottish BIPOC Writers Network and led by the Edinburgh Macro, Hannah Lavery. And Hannah has been great these past two years of really setting us up with the task of responding if we choose to whatever has been going on around us. And so a lot of my poems written during those group sessions 
has been about just dealing with um, sort of the terror and uh, exhaustion of living through a pandemic, um, but also trying to learn to be kinder to myself. So this is I Am Listening. I am listening to my heart more, to the waves crashing in me to the orbital pool of the moon. Yesterday, I took myself for a walk, let the sun beat down on my skin, looked into every crevice that I passed. Afterwards, I took myself for a swim, dove deep inside my mind to where anchors once weighed me down. I swam past the delta's edge. Something or someone was pulling me toward its sound. I began to swim further out, searching for that whale's call which reverberated in the dark. Yesterday, I let myself be still, waited among dangerous silence, finally acknowledged what I want. Uh, this penultimate poem of this section is a favorite of mine. Uh, this was one of the first poems I uh, had published in a Scottish uh, based magazine. Um, and yeah, it is a poem, again, sort of working through these ideas of well being and mental health and trying to find joy in the natural world. So this is Bottled Blue. I want to capture blue, bottle it up in its breezy and effortless hue, take it with me on long journeys. I want that color to anoint me, wash me in Florida water, like chrism on my baptism day, cradled in my father's arms over the font. That blue follows me around like a phantom balloon whose helium never dies, long string tied to finger, a reminder. 29 years around the sun and that color never gets old, even if I do bright as ever and still moving. It lives in the sky, the sea, the mighty ocean. Blue can transport me back to happier times, can evoke feeling through memory, can transcend a lifetime. When you look up at the sky, untainted by clouds or rain, do you ever wonder why does blue mean sad? For me, it means renewal, it means rebirth, blue is redemption. Yes, I long to bottle blue, keep it safe forever until the day I need to share with you some happiness. Blue will be tied around my neck, wearing it like an amulet, I'll cross myself in its salvation. Blue, the holiest of colors. Uh, so for my last poem for this section is one definitely about family, uh, and I think sort of de uh, it definitely play, uh, speaks to the theme of uh, LGBT History Month this year and Blurring Borders. Um, it, this poem is dedicated to anyone who is part of di a diasporic community or um, who is a, a, a child or grandchild of immigrants and has had to grow up in a very unique way of um, spending weekends on phone calls with people you don't really know well, but you are forced to because if you don't, your mother will kill you. Uh, and you sit there on a phone speaking to them, sometimes in a mother tongue that you're not very comfortable with. Um, but it's how you keep these communities uh, and these family connections alive. So this is Si Dios Quiere. Abuela sits on the other side of a telephone line, sipping café from a Mickey Mouse mug. I'll see you in a month, mamá. Si Dios quiere, mijo, si Dios quiere. If God wants, they would want me to be obedient, chaste, and ever faithful, to remember to say evening prayers and not eat meat on Lenten Fridays. But if God wants something particular of me, I think they would want me to be arroboso, threaded by an ancient needle, stretched out above memories that chase me. If God dreams, they would dream me as abuela pins clothes to a line under the mid-morning sun as heat rises off freshly scrubbed terracotta tile. 
If God imagined, they would imagine me safely walking hand in hand, languidly under summer clouds as he whispers in my ear, te amo. If God transforms, they would transform me into a brilliant butterfly dancing freely over fresh flowers, roses, hyacinths, marigolds, sipping nectar in a drunken spring days. If God creates, they would create me, a map stretched out over mountains and seas, water blurring the hard ink line of borders to carry me to places not yet traveled. Estás aquí, mijo. Si, sí, mamá, I'm here. If God wants, they would want me to exist forever, so Abuela always has someone on the other side of an unbreakable line, waiting to greet her like a sun that never sets. Wow, those are all those are all so beautiful, and um, I I personally can really relate to kind of these um, these feelings of. Uh, Kind of being in a culture where where you know that you have these connections in other places but you're kind of a, a second or third generation immigrant and it's it's this very kind of interesting way of existing in the world um so i kind of wanted to ask a little bit more about that actually and um something you've you've touched on in this and um i've seen that you've you've talked about in regards to your work in other places um, is this idea of kind of transient identities and transient experiences. And um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about how that manifests in your work and kind of why it's important to you or personally significant to kind of explore the, the idea of transientness. Yeah, I think for me, it's just first and foremost because that is has ultimately been my experience you know it it's been very in it was very interesting to grow up in a way where you're moving sort of every two to three years um and and in countries sometimes where your ethnic or racialized identity doesn't make sense and then what does that do or you get read in different ways you know so um like I, when I was living in Turkey and stuff, sometimes people thought that I was Turkish or they thought my mother was Egyptian, and, which is like very interesting. Um, and, and, or, you know, I, I speak especially to other sort of people from the Latinx diaspora of like being um, sort of uh, this indecipherable identity when you're living in the UK, because just statistically, we are so underrepresented, I think. Um, in total, there's a, I, the estimate is like maybe 150,000 people from Latin America or Latinx uh, uh, diaspora, whereas someone who is American or Mexican American, uh, as in America, the uh, the Hispanic Latino uh, ethnic group is the largest non-white ethnic group in the US, I think it's somewhere at like 26%. So it's interesting to then have these ideas of in some places, like when I'm in America, I am othered in a way that makes sense to people. And so it's immediate, oh, okay, you're Mexican. Oh, okay, you're Mexican American. And then, you know, are, were you born here? You know, are your parents, were they born here? And then you get into notions of like, are you documented? Are you undocumented? And this idea of your body at times like being read before you get to speak. And what does that do to you? And then um, when it comes to sort of sexual identity or, or you know, or, or gender identity, when things are put upon you before you get to say anything, speak before, you know, you get spoken before or spoken about before you even go to get to lay claim to uh, a sense of the self. And then add that on top of just someone like me who just is uh, uh, obsessed with this idea of identity and belonging, you know, of how then that can sort of change and manifest. And it feels very transitory and transient. Uh, and, and I think for me, I will probably always spend my life exploring those ideas in my writing because I don't know that I ever will truly feel fixed, you know? 
Um, only two of my four grandparents are still alive. So a thing that I've sort of been contending with the past few years is like when they ultimately, the last two pass, what is my connection to Mexico? I still will have lots of great aunts and uncles and sort of second and third cousins who live there, but I didn't grow up there. My parents haven't been back to Mexico since they were in their late teens. So this notion of a country that you are told you're from that you're read as othered because you're from, um, what does that, ha what happens to that then? Do you lose that motherland? Um, did you ever have it? Did I ever have it? I don't know. And then, you know, for my grandparents to make that decision to, um, to immigrate to America, and then my father, by nature of his job that he chose, um, uh, meant that me as the second generation American then spent most of his life out of the US. So then it's like, what is my claim? Like we've not even been in the country that long and now we're already uprooting and going. And then I decide, you know, I, I meet someone from Scotland, we get married and I am now an immigrant and I've left. So it just, I think that it will, that's just going to be built. It, it will be something that I will contend with with the rest of my life. And I think I've, I've often spoken about the collection that I, it's very temporal. So what I've said, the, the title, at least this I know, is what I know now in my early 30s. If I were to write this collection, try to write this collection again 10 years down the line, my notions of where I fit or sit uh, or how I express myself or my identity or what identity markers I choose to lay claim to, I think will could very well change. And that's, I think, ultimately where my interest in this transient nature comes from. Do you want to go, David? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I will do. I, I just loved that whole conversation, the sort of being part of a land that, you know, you haven't really seen. I mean, I have a similar thing that my mother is from Colombia. I haven't been there since I was six. I barely know the place, but I've got all this family over there. So I know the feeling and it's it's just so crazy. And with the whole, you know, there aren't that many Latinx individuals <laughs> in the UK. Yeah, I, I very much get where you're coming from, though. I've been in the UK since ever, so slightly less moving about in my story, but really interesting to hear about that journey and sort of the moving about and the different feelings and the way, as a minority, you're treated differently based on, you know, the sort of strength or weakness of that minority in a given geographic yeah. area. So when I went to the States, yeah, it was really weird. I wasn't used to it. <laughs> just that being a thing. So it was really interesting to touch on that. So I think it's time we hit on the sort of next set of poems, if you're happy to do so. Yeah, yeah. And then we'll do a final sort of one of our pre-baked questions, and yeah. then we'll run into the Q&A. Perfect. Um, so these next set of poems, uh, or at least the first few, are, are come from the section that I sort of allowed myself to be uh, very expressive about my queer identity. I was very fortunate in 2020 to get um, a grant from the Edwin Morgan Trust to celebrate uh, his centenary. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Morgan, uh, he was um, the macker of Scotland, the first macker. Uh, he was a brilliant poet uh, who didn't start really publishing until his 40s and didn't come out publicly until he was uh, in his 70s, but wrote so brilliantly about love and desire and many other things. Um, but as a queer uh, poet, uh, I really was, I just, I fell so in love and I'm obsessed with how Morgan wrote about love and desire. So this first poem, Amor, is a uh, trying to sort of speak in conversation to poems like Strawberries that Morgan is famous for. So this is Amor. I am going to nurture him like a nopal, make him grow pretty flowers but remove his spiny needle, until he stands tall, until he is fully formed, until I can hold him close. Then I will gather him, take his flower and his fruit and burn it all until our love is something new. 
transform it into tequila, mezcal, until our love is sotol, pulque, thick, racia, crystal clear. Like the drink, our love will be pure, will burn our tongues and throats, will bring the blues in the morning. Um, this next poem was written uh, during uh, one of our last sort of uh, pandemics or global viruses that seems to happen a lot in, in human history. This was written during swine flu uh, based on a real life event where I momentarily uh, imagined a love story with someone I sat next to on a plane uh, where we had almost a seven hour delay at the airport while the Japanese government were deciding whether or not they were gonna let us enter the country. So this is written um, for a love that could have happened, but uh, as you'll learn, uh, uh, never did. This is Newark Liberty International Airport. In a departure lounge in the state of New Jersey, the least beautiful one, that's where I first saw you. You were older than me with beautiful blue eyes lined with circles like a trunk of sequoia. Your name, Adam, meaning to be red, meaning to make, made from dirt. Like the first man, Adam, my first man, Adam, my man, made fantasy. While the plane taxied, you asked me questions of my travels to come while I made up our story. Blurring our present and future with memories of your hands, tracing our timeline together, tracing the outline of our love. I dreamt of our first good morning as the sun rose above the Pacific, as the sun shone brightly on your face, as I imagined you kissing me. We talked between the midnight hours over a meal, which I could not say was breakfast or dinner, but would be our first together. At the baggage carousel, I would bump into you, tired, but still enamored, happy to see your familiar face. I would want to be braver, want to invite you to my room, want to feel your hands span the time zones of my body. But I'd simply say goodbye as you kissed me on the cheek and wished me well, waving me off into the ether. You see, I once met an Adam seated next to me on a plane, introduced myself to him, did nothing to become his Eve. Um, so the last few poems, I think, uh, bring us back to this idea of, of rootedness with it, what it means to be rooted within country and trying to find belonging in, uh, in different places, especially when you might not be uh, from there or have sort of long history uh, with, with a place. So this poem is written in, uh, in honor of my Scottish family who are uh, originally from the Northeast. So this is a shout out to uh, Aberdeenshire. This poem is Benahi. We drank tea from a flask atop Benahi, remember? You showed me the land, said, this made me. You pointed to the river, understood it to be yours, every mile of every hill, every crag woven into your DNA. Had a memory of every coordinate, and I longed for just some of it. I longed to know a land like that close enough to feel at home, and for that home to love me back like I was her one and only son. Uh, so this is my penultimate poem. This poem is written uh, uh, to uh, my fellow uh, writers of color who are part of the Scottish BIPOC Writers Network, they've been instrumental in sort of my development as a writer um, and, and I wanted to celebrate them. So this poem is Ceremony or a poem for my writers group. The tea is steeping in cracked porcelain, hibiscus, chamomile, darjeeling and black leaves brewing. Their colorful oils like a spectrum creeping out the muslin and filling the pot with mixed flavor. If you took our community, steeped us all in one copper container, what would the drink taste like? 
many nations, shades, colors, all mapping out diasporas, melding into one watered down history. Left together to brew in collective trauma, but we are not of one single origin nor a single blend. And yet, our tea is steeping in an ancient cauldron with leaves kept intact by the strength of their design. So this is my last poem. Um, this poem uh, is very much uh, about the self and working through uh, a history uh, of being a part of, from a country that has uh, such uh, a complicated history with colonialism and, and, and then being a racialized body living in the US and trying to contend with, okay, you can be racialized elsewhere, but at some point, you know, my motherland has to contend with it, its relationship with colonialism and how so many Mexicans, especially those who might identify as mestizo, are, uh, are tied to this very bloody legacy. So this is Endless after Franz Fanon. In the world through which I travel, I am endlessly in search of myself with no fixed point in mind. No longer Am I Luna or Escobedo, no longer a Munoz, have since lost Maldonado in my story. When I landed in Basque country, I could not even anchor Orderica to the bloodshed of my past. I could not see myself in the vista as desperate as I was. I waded through marshland, split weathered skin on sandstone, dove into the harsh Atlantic cold. None of these lands could reflect me. Each one turned their cheek, whispering to go further. So I did. In the world through which I travel, I am continuously rewriting myself with no fixed point in mind. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, for the sake of those who might not know what mestizo means, Andres, would you care to explain the term? Because I know what it means and you do, but... Yep, so it, 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 it's a sort of a classification of people who would have uh, uh, indigenous blood in them, but uh, most likely primarily uh, Spanish blood or, you know, in the case of Mexico, uh, France was there for some time, but European blood. And, and it was, it came really about uh, sort of very soon after uh, colonization. And it was a way for, for um, the colonies to classify themselves and, and get to decide who is the purebred. And, and, you know, and, and, and like many colonized countries uh, created a very uh, insidious sort of obsession with colorism and, and how close one could link themselves to uh, uh, European ancestors, because that was seen as being the best. A and, and so, yeah, Mestizo is this complicated thing um, where you're sort of sitting in this liminal space, but you know, you're not free of the fact, or I'm not free of the fact that there's a very ugly history to, to that. Uh, and it's something we have to contend with. And I think there is a lot going on in Mexico right now to do that and a lot of great activists um, who are, uh, yeah, putting others to task. There's definitely a lot of baggage that comes with mestizo <laughs> identity. So good to have that one just explained more for sort of those who might not know, because again, it's not something you come across in the UK very yeah. often. <laughs> So I, I guess the final of the sort of set questions that we had before we go into the more general Q&As, how important do you feel it is for art to really sort of open our eyes to a wider world of different places, different cultures? And do you feel that your work is basically your way of in, in part addressing that? Uh, definitely. I think for me, I would be so bored if I was only reading things that mirrored my lived experience, you know, I think there's a myriad of, of perspectives out there. And I don't understand why one wouldn't want to engage, you know, I got asked this question the other day by an interviewer of, of you know, do you, 
how do you think we should and how do we um, encourage new stories? Uh, do, is there a need for new stories? And what I said to them or I challenged them was like, I don't think, how can you have new stories? I think ultimately as humans, we have universal emotions and feelings, experiences that we all go through. I think the challenge is, or that we, we need to actively encourage is who are the storytellers, you know, because these different perspectives are going to enlighten us. It's going to show a new facet of, of this emotion, this this right of human, uh, uh, a right of, of passage, you know, we all at some point will have to contend with death in our lives, whether it's our own death or the death of a loved one. That's such a universal experience. So being able to read that through uh, through different sort of uh, religious groups or people who come from different religious groups, different culture groups, how do we honor the dead? I find that really interesting, you know. So I think for me, I hope that this collection is giving people sort of uh, uh, their first foray maybe into exploring Latinx culture or specifically Mexican culture or Mexican-American culture, this very liminal state. Um, but yeah, for me, I, I would be so bored with a homogenous bookshelf, you know? And so I, I think for me, yes, you know, there needs to be new perspectives that challenge us that help us to think very differently or even process it you know sometimes if you can get out with your own self and you hear something said in a different way it can be very illuminating and you can say gosh that was so profound i've never thought about it that way but that's really what it feels like you know to lose someone or that really is what it feels like to um you know to feel like everything is kind of burning in flames and you don't know that you don't feel like you can do anything about it and then you read someone of how it can start in a very small way and then you're like that's a community I want to be a part of I I, I don't see it in my immediate sort of um, sight line but now I know about it because I read about it and there are other people who are feeling this sort of innate anger and I can then now find more community, more community. out there so for me it is it's vital because or else you'll, we just become static and our perspectives become static. And I think if that's the case, that would be a very sad way of existing. Okay. Right, so with that, I'll open up to the Q&A. We've already got one question in there. So anyone else who has any other questions, feel free to just hammer them in as we go. So the first question we have is from Rashni, which is, I find it interesting to know that some of the collection was written during lockdown. I'd be really curious to know how you feel able to keep in touch with your creative emotions through day-to-day -day life. Um, I think for me, it's it was like a, a mode of survival. Um, I, especially someone who is now, right now, has been uh, apart from uh, my family, um, you know, and many of my friends, like it was a way of, of sort of keeping head above water. I'm someone who finds a lot of just joy in purpose in writing. I have a lot of writer friends who have not written for like the past two years, who were really just so thrown off kilter by all of this, which is totally understandable. You know, I think it's been really interesting to hear conversations about, you know, concepts of, of productivity and, and, you know, how this feeling of not being productive can really cause very serious damage upon one's mental health. I, I just, I don't have that relationship with writing where I feel, I don't see it in that kind of commodity sense. So for me, it was more of like, um, it's such a stupid phrase, but like a form of self care, you know, like for me to, to like daily and, and not every day was I writing during lockdown, but like to have it sustain me through that week was really a way of just not losing my mind within these same four walls because I was en able to enter these other worlds. Um, and, and also again, because I was so far away from family and, and during uh, the past two years, I, you know, I did lose some family members passed away from COVID. And so it was a way of processing grief. Uh, grief exists a lot in this collection. And I think for me, 
it was a way of not having to suffer by holding it inward. I at least got it out on the page. And then, you know, having that sort of that um, camaraderie of my writers group and feeling very comfortable to be able to share those poems with them was also very helpful. So maybe it also was a form of, of therapy for me. And again, that's just my relationship, but I totally appreciate all of my writer friends who, you know, were like, I can't write right now. I can't even read right now. Like these things that bring me joy, I just, I feel very stuck. And, and that must be really difficult, um, especially if it's something that normally gives you so much joy. answer i don't see any other questions in the thing at the moment zara are we willing to open up to people raising hands or are we yeah well um we've got um uh one question from jonathan that's just popped in uh the uh the chat which is um uh, he's asking if another queer um, BPOC person watching you wanted to write more, do you think you could tell us a bit more about this, uh, the Writers Network or other kind of options um, for people exploring that? Definitely. Yep. So the Scottish BPOC Writers Network is uh, an amazing organization that's been around uh, since 2018. It was founded by um, the poets Alicia Pramohamed and Jay um, Gao. And it is um, it's a, an organization that's whole uh, uh, ethos is, uh, you know, it's self-identifying. So if you identify as a person of color, you are welcomed in that space. You know, it really is trying to challenge these. Um, uh, some people of color have a, uh, a contentious relationship with the term BAME. <laughs> that's sort of neither here nor there, because that could get us in a very complicated thing. But uh, for the network, it is about self-identification and welcoming people in spaces, because sometimes uh, people of color from racialized backgrounds can have a very complicated uh, relationship with the race, especially if you're mixed race, you sometimes don't feel, you don't know all the time in which spaces you are allowed to enter. And it is very much about a network uh, of allowing anyone from any diasporic community, any racialized community, anyone who identifies as a person of color to enter. And it's all about writing, ultimately. You don't have to be a professional writer. You don't have to be a published writer. You don't ha your end goal doesn't have to be about doing anything with what you write in the workshops or, or master classes. It's all about just the space to come together to work through these ideas and also to challenge these notions that as someone of a marginalized identity that you have to always sort of engage with trauma. You know, we often try to challenge ourselves by writing about joy or, or just being irreverent. Um, and th there um, is also a, a sort of subgroup, a, a, a QT BIPOC, uh, so many acronyms, um, but basically it's for queer people of color um, and that's led by one of the program managers, May Diane Sangu, who's an amazing Aberdonian poet and they um, have been running that, but there is so much and uh, a lot of the workshops are either free or on a pay what you can scale. Their model is very much about trying to be as inclusive and accessible as possible and it's a space where really I feel that I've been able to flourish these past four years living in Scotland. I don't think I would have gotten the body of work out that I have without those spaces. Um, and it's great because what's been so amazing for me is kind of realizing as small of a country Scotland is, it, there is a lot of diversity. And, and in the past two years with, uh, you know, so many things moving online within the network, we've got to reach out to many more people than we would have when we were doing in-person events. And we really were kind of um, not doing our best because we were only really hitting, um, you know, the central belt. And actually there are people of color all over Scotland, in the Highlands, in the islands. And it's been really amazing to kind of engage with people and learn that there are other people doing really great work. So I really recommend it. Um, uh, their website, yes, has been included um, recently. Uh, and it, it was, I applaud them. It was uh, a very uh, brave and bold decision. So you'll see, it used to be the Scottish Fame Writers Network. 
Um, I used to work with the organization. It's taken a really long time to get us to a place to move to something that feels what the network really wants. So you'll slowly see on Twitter and social media, you'll find them as the Scottish BIPOC Writers Network. Um, if any of you work in sort of uh, uh, digital tech spaces, you'll know it's not so easy to just change a website overnight. So that is soon to come. But again, they're really great. There's also, um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff online. You know, I think uh, I can't remember everything off the top of my head. If you find me on Twitter and you want to know, please do reach out. Um, and you know, there's a lot of great things happening down south as well. Um, because of COVID and stuff, a lot of great sort of collectives that are very transnational and very global have come about as well. And people have realized, actually, we have the tools there. Um, we don't have to be so siloed. We can find other people out there who are kind of writing within spaces or with intention that mirrors um, what I want to do or what you might want to do. So definitely reach out and I'll share whatever I can. I'll follow that one up by actually saying I'm a member of the poetry part of the network. So <laughs> they're actually really, really good crack and wonderful people. So if you do want to get involved, absolutely go for it. Fantastic. Do we have any more questions um, from the Q&A? Um, I think if anyone would like to raise their hand and ask the question on the mic, that's also OK. Um, although I'm not seeing any. No, we've got one that's already Ooh. been answered in in the chat, which is if someone wanted to contact Andres, how could they do so? And the details are there in the chat at the moment. Yeah, the yeah, Andres's details are uh, in the chat, um, and also all of our details are in the chat of the Staff Pride Network as well. I've Mike. got an, another question. Uh, okay that uh, is linked to Staff Pride Network. Uh, the, uh, are there any events that you're going to uh, that you've seen this UK LGBT plus history month, or in fact, with it being uh, Black History Month in the US uh, with your, uh, where you uh, grew up, uh, perhaps you might be attending events there that uh, people watching might be interested in, as well, of course, as the Staff Pride Network events uh, coming up on the 23rd and 24th by Plus uh, Histories um, and uh, event with uh, Queer Story Scotland uh, that uh, on the blur blurring boundaries, uh, borders uh, themes of. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, um, if, I mean, obviously this is the University of Edinburgh, so I assume everyone is based in Edinburgh, but if you happen to be in Aberdeen, um, not this weekend, but next Saturday, which I believe is the 19th, uh, the Scottish BIPOC Writers Network is putting on a showcase of queer poets of color at the Lemon Tree. I won't be there, but it's going to be amazing. I, again, I think that as I was saying to the network, it's been really a mission to try to get out of the central belt. There's so many great things happening elsewhere within Scotland. So, um, if you know people who are up in Aberdeen, um, tell them to go out and have a great night out. Um, for me, what else? Uh, I mean, if you're not, if you are not sick of me already uh, and you want to see me again, uh, I will be performing uh, for LGBT History Month. I'll be headlining a um, an event with. Uh, Edinburgh Libraries on the 21st at 7.30 p.m. You can watch it on their Facebook uh, live stream and I'll be sharing some poems and exploring more of the collection. And then, yeah, um, I'm sure there's a lot. I just, it's been so busy <laughs> launching a collection. I probably have missed lots of events, but I do know there's a lot of great things going on. Thank you. We'll be uh, sure to Find, our, find those links and share those on our social media. Speaking of Staff Pride Network, can I take this opportunity to plug uh, my Staff Pride Network book club? Because I assume if we're all here, we are fans of literature in general. <laughs> so um, if uh, so, we run uh, every month uh, the Staff Pride Network run book club. It's 
is open to any LGBTQ plus uh, staff or allies, uh, staff and uh, postgraduate research students. Um, and yeah, we meet once a month. Um, at the moment, it's all been quite online, but we are trying to move slightly more in person. Um, and uh, we discuss all kinds of books um, that you can submit anything you want to the reading list and they're all chosen randomly out the hat. So we end up reading uh, quite an eclectic mix of things. Uh, we have read poetry in the past. We've read uh, lots of, uh, we've read fiction, we've read nonfiction, we've read self-help books, we've read all sorts. So um, yeah, if you're interested, uh, drop me a, a line and I can add you to the mailing list. That's my plug, that's me done. <laughs> I guess if no one else has any uh, questions or comments or things to plug, then um, we can wrap it up. So thank you so much to uh, Andres for um, speaking to us and reading his poetry today. Uh, thanks to uh, Erin and Rashni in particular for putting this together um, and the Staff Pride Network. Thanks to Robbie for doing tech stuff. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone. Hi, thank, thank you. you so much for having Bye. me. <laughs> Bye -bye.